Hello everyone, welcome to lecture number six with the topic of limits at infinity and horizontal asymptotes. Just like the previous topic involved also some form of infinity with limits and some form of asymptotes, which were vertical. So you will see that there's similarities here. And let me just start by saying, by reminding you about this word asymptote, what that means. So here's a reminder, an asymptote of the graph of a function f is a line that the graph approaches. This is like our informal definition. And I have a few examples here of both vertical and horizontal. So let's read those two items here. Vertical asymptotes can only happen at a value for x. It's always a, like x equals eight. And what we're gonna see today is that horizontal and also slanted asymptotes, those can only happen as x goes off towards plus or minus infinity. So you'll see what I mean in the examples here. This, this right here was the topic of lecture number five, the, uh, sorry, four, vertical asymptotes. The equation of a vertical line is always x equals something, x equals a number. So that's what I mean when I say it can only happen at a specific value for x. And as we saw before, what's happening here is that the limit of the function as it will approach this number a, at least from one of the sides, is a form of infinity, either plus or minus. In this particular example, it's actually both. Both limits are a form of infinity. So these were called inf infinite limits. Now, what we're interested in today, again, we're trying to understand overall shapes of graphs and this particular property of a graph of it becoming more and more horizontal as x increases either in the plus direction or the minus direction. Uh, this is a useful property to know about the graph. That's what we mean by horizontal asymptote. So look at this particular graph here. You see that when x is going to minus infinity, it's just increasing forever. We don't care about that, but the, the other direction as x goes to plus infinity, the graph tends to become more and more horizontal and approaching this dotted red line here, which is the line y equals l. L is this particular number, the height at which that line is. So we're gonna call that a horizontal asymptote. And we're gonna say that the limit of the function as x goes to infinity is equal to the number L. Once again, just contrast this with the infinite limit above where x was going to a number and the value was infinity. Now the rows are kind of reversed. The infinity is down here in the limit symbol. So this is an example of a graph that has a horizontal asymptote. This is a graph that has two of them in both directions. So two values, L1 and L2, and the lines Y equals L1 and Y equals L2, they're both horizontal asymptotes. And it's because the limits of, of F of X, as X, the limit as X approaches infinity is equal to L1, as you can see in the graph right here. And the limit as, F approach, as X approaches minus infinity is this number L2, as you can see right here. Notice also, by the way, that the graph is actually intersecting one of these lines. Look at this point right here. Uh, you can see the, the blue graph is intersecting this red line, y equals L1. So it's, it's wrong to say that the graph of a function cannot intercept its asymptote. It can, it can actually do that many times. What's important is that eventually, as x becomes larger and larger, it starts to approach that line. Even this approach might be, you know, going up and down, oscillating around that line. That's still fine. Here's now just an example of a slanted asymptote. What does that mean? We're not going to talk about this much, but it, it just means, again, the graph is approaching a line that's slanted. It's not horizontal or vertical. It's this particular graph here is doing, you can see that as X approaches infinity, the the value of the limit is also infinity because the graph is growing without bounds. But it is in such a way that it approaches this particular red line here. And I, I'm going to leave for a recitation this week an example involving this particular concept of slanted asymptotes. But for the rest of today, I'll be focusing on the horizontal ones. So now I'm just going to write down the definition of limits at infinity. 
these are definitions that you should copy down in your notes at this point at this point if you're taking notes now i'm going to read about them we are looking at the first one here limit at infinity so this particular scenario suppose f is a function whose domain includes positive numbers as large as one once why are we doing that because we're, we want to say something about the limit at infinity so you better make sure that it's possible to take x to infinity inside of the domain of f if the domain stopped somewhere and then you cannot define f for larger for values of x larger than that somewhere then you don't have a limit so okay suppose you have a function like that then we say that the limit of f of x as x approaches infinity is a number l in symbols this is what we write when the values of f of x become arbitrarily close to l as x becomes sufficiently large and positive i hope this makes sense to you based on the drawings that we had that x is the thing that's becoming larger and larger f of x is actually becoming closer and closer to a number the number l so when that happens we call we write this symbol and by the way, I have a particular note here on the side. Notice that we actually don't write this. If you think about what happens in a limit at plus infinity, it is a form of lateral limit, right? You can only approach the number plus infinity if you're coming from the left side of it. You cannot come from, from a side larger than infinity. So in theory, it is a lateral limit. You, you might want to write this symbol here, infinity minus indicating coming from the left but we don't do that it's simply not done so forget about lateral notation for limits at infinity even though it is a form of lateral limit and the next definition i have here is basically the same i'm just defining what it means for the limit to be at minus infinity so i'm going to circle the differences here uh yeah so now we want to we want to take x to minus infinity so first of all, you better make sure that the domain of your function includes numbers which are arbitrarily large and negative. And then the definition is the same. F of X should approach L, arbitrarily close to L, when X becomes sufficiently large and negative this time. That's the symbol. And then finally, the definition of horizontal asymptote. This is what we have, we have just described. If the limit of a function at x equals as x goes to infinity exists and is equal to a number l, then we call the line y equals l a horizontal asymptote. And similarly, it might also have been the limit at minus infinity. So in parentheses here, a graph can have at most two horizontal asymptotes because it's the you can have at most two values for, for an infinite limit, one at plus and one at minus infinity. So these were our definitions. Now I'm moving on. I, again, I'm just drawing specific graphs of functions here so we can see these concepts happening. I have four functions, f, g, h, and p. This is not a problem, by the way, it's just an example. I'm just gonna say things about these graphs. So look at the first one, x squared. We all know that that's a parabola. As it turns out, there are no asymptotes here, not even slanted the arms of the parabola actually just tend to be more and more vertical as x grows so there are no limits at infinity or minus infinity i mean you can say the limit at infinity is also infinity for example we're going to talk about that a little later now i'm looking at the second graph here g of x equals e to dx minus four this is what the graph looks like it's the e to dx graph uh, translated down by four units and you can see that the limit as x goes to minus infinity is actually minus four right here and the uh, the graph this is because by looking at the graph we can see that because the graph is becoming closer and closer to the number minus four as x goes to minus infinity so it becomes it, it tends to approach this line y equals negative four the red dotted line here so that line is a horizontal asymptote and this graph only has one now here's a graph that again only has one horizontal asymptote but it actually happens to be 
uh, an asymptote for both infinite, uh, both limits at infinity. So the function was this h here, a rational function. As it turns out, if you graph it out, you'll see that the the line y equals one, which is this horizontal dotted line here. Uh, that line is is what the graph is approaching, both as x goes to minus infinity and as x goes to plus infinity. So then the height of that line is one, so we call the value of the limit one. And y equals one is a horizontal asymptote. This graph also has a vertical asymptote, by the way, x equals two, but we're not talking about that in this lecture. And finally, here's a graph that has two horizontal asymptotes. It has this S shape, a graph shaped like this is sometimes called a sigmoid. So the function is kind of complicated, here it is. And you can see that it has values for limits both at plus infinity and at minus infinity, and they are one and minus three. So both of the lines, y equals one, y equals minus three, are horizontal asymptotes of this graph. And once again, I, I will have just one example of a problem like this in here, which is guess the values. As I told you before, this is not really what we focus on in calc. You will, you're unlikely to find a problem like this on an exam. We actually want to be able to compute this algebraically, and we're gonna do this after this example. But this one is here just to show you the idea of limits at infinity. It is saying, guess the values of those limits by plugging in test values for x. So the way that you should think about this is, for example, if you're trying to understand the first limit, this is a limit as x goes to plus infinity, what you need to do is plug in values for x which are larger and larger without bounds and see what's happening to the function. So I once again uh, did this calculation before with a over alpha. So I'm gonna copy the numbers from my notes here. You see that, for example, if x is equal to 10, this number is approximately 0 0.0000454. And if x is equal to 100, so a larger x, it will be approximately 3.72 times 10 to the minus 44. You should know that if, you, if you're raising 10 to a negative power, that's an extremely small number. So you can see that the numbers tend to be getting smaller. You could, you could have tried 1,000 instead of 100. Now you get even smaller. So just based on those two, what we can probably guess, let me call the function f, that as x is going to plus infinity, as x is getting larger and larger, the function itself is getting close to 0 because that's what, what it looks like these numbers are doing. They're getting smaller. So that was the idea here. We're gonna do the same thing now for negative infinity. How, what changes about this now is we need to plug in values for x, which are again large, but this time negative. So I have tried the values minus 10 and minus 100. Uh, okay, approximately equal. If you plug in minus 10, you will find a value of about 0 0.9999. Five, four, six, and you flip. If you plug each of the minus a hundred, you will find a number that has a lot of nines before it becomes six to eight. I even tried to count these nine. It's about fifty nines. It's a lot of nines. So you should know when you look at this number, it's it's just a little bit less than one. That's what it looks like. These numbers are doing. If you plug in a thousand now or minus a thousand, you will see even more nines. So based on these, we can probably guess that the function is trying to become one and it's even coming from below one. The values are slightly less than one. So that should be the limit as, as x goes to minus infinity. So this was the problem about guessing the value by plugging in values for x. But let's now 
work algebraically. Let's compute limits. The remark, the quick, quick remark that you should be aware of is that the limit loss, the things that we studied, like limit of the sum is the sum of the limits, limit of the quotient is the quotient of the limits as long as the one in the denominator is not zero. So all of that, they also apply for this form of limit now. Before we were doing that only for numbers or also lateral limits at numbers. So you had a little a. This time we don't have the a, but it's the same. The laws apply. And in particular, you should also be aware of the second one. If you have a quotient, a over b, let's say that the limit at the top is not zero. However, the bottom becomes arbitrarily large in magnitude. So in that case, you have like a number divided by a really large number. It could be either positive or negative, doesn't matter. What happens to this expression? What is this limit? It's zero. This should also be very intuitive for you because you're basically dividing a fixed number by a number which is getting larger and larger. So, you know, a fraction with a large denominator is going to be a small number. So that's a useful thing to remember right here. It actually doesn't have to do specifically with the limits at infinity. This, this is the same for any type of limit. So here are some simple examples. Compute the following limits. Let's look at item A. We have a difference of two expressions, one of them being just a, a constant number, number three. And the other is the one that has X in it. So this is just here to show you that this is going to be a limit of a difference. So we can write this as a difference of limits as long as each one exists separately, and they do. Okay, so when you look at the first one, the limit of three is just three. Three is the constant function. What number does it approach? It approaches three. The second one is the one that's more interesting here. What happens here, you can probably write this symbol if you want. It's not, I wouldn't call this equal, but that's fine in, in a calc course, for example. We're not trying to be too rigorous here. And it gives you the right idea of what's happening. Let's look, let's try to understand this. We're basically saying that as x goes to infinity, the number x to the five is also going to infinity. It's also getting larger and larger. So you write this symbol here, infinity, and now you have two divided by infinity. And that's an informal symbol. It doesn't represent a number, but you can call you can say that that is equal to zero. Any number that's not zero divided by infinity is zero. That's this property that we just we were just mentioning up here. Uh, you're basically dividing a number, the number two, by numbers which are getting larger and larger. So your fraction is getting smaller and smaller. So you have the answer three here. B is going to be very similar, uh, but one there's one tricky thing in here that we should all remember let me just say that now the square root of x squared is always the absolute value of x don't ever forget this it's not x you cannot cancel the square root of the square and and become just x that's wrong and it shouldn't be too hard to understand why for example imagine if x is negative when you take x squared that, that becomes positive and then the square root of a positive number, by definition, is always a positive number. So it would be wrong to say that this is equal to x because if x is negative, that would be a negative number. That's why we have the absolute value. So don't forget this. Okay, so let's now look at item B. We have this limit, x is going to minus infinity. I'm gonna copy down the limit first. And then I'm gonna say that this is equal. Okay, first of all, I'm simplifying the square root of x squared, replacing that with absolute value of x. And now I'm gonna say this is equal. Instead of writing absolute value of x, I'm gonna write minus x. 
why can I do that? The reason is that x is going to minus infinity. So when you're studying this limit, you're trying to think of x as a number that's larger and larger, but also negative. So you may assume that x is negative. And if x is negative, absolute value of x is equal to minus x. So I'm even going to write this down here because x is negative. Okay, and now we have an expression that's just polynomials or rational functions. We can try to analyze what happens to it. This particular expression here, we probably don't want to try to simplify it, write it as just one fraction because it's already in a useful form for us. It's going to be enough to understand numerator and denominator separately. That's what we're gonna do. Um, So here's, here's a good way to think about this. What is the limit in the numerator? One plus one over x. X is going to minus infinity. This is one of those where we can, we'll write this informal symbol, one divided by minus infinity. And again, that's a zero. So this is just like the previous example, item A. The only difference is that there is a sign difference now. It's minus infinity instead of plus infinity. But that's irrelevant for us if the result is going to be a zero anyway. It just means that this, this represents right here a number that's negative, but very small. And in the limit, it's just equal to the number zero. Doesn't matter that it came from the negative side instead of the positive, it's just a zero. And then one plus that is one, that's the numerator but the denominator is going to infinity or my, well, plus infinity. Just think about what's happening. X is going to negative infinity, but we have minus X in there. So that's, that becomes a large number and positive. So you see that studying this numerator and denominator separately was enough for us because that gives you the, the value zero for the limit. So just to conclude, I'm gonna just repeat the, the limit that we had above. I'm gonna say that it's equal to one over infinity, which is a zero. All right. Okay, moving on. All right, we have, we have already mentioned this in the examples. What I'm talking about here is just to formalize the definition that a limit at infinity might also be an inf infinite number, or you shouldn't, shouldn't call that infinite number, but just infinity, instead of being an L. So if you think about it, let read the, the comment after this definition first. If you think about this type of limits, there are four different ones that you can think of. The x could be going to plus or minus infinity, and the infinity value that you're finding could be either plus or minus. There are four different ones. I'm only putting the writing the definition for one of them in here. Infinite limit and minus infinity. But the idea should be uh, should be straightforward here. We say that the limit as x approaches minus infinity is plus infinity when, so what should be happening here? F of X should be approaching infinity and X should be approaching minus infinity. So it is exactly what's written here. The values of F of X become arbitrarily large and positive as X becomes sufficiently large and negative. And here is just one graph example, it's kind of a crazy graph, oscillates a little, but the arrows at the, at the tips of the graph, they indicate that, I mean, just looking at it, we don't, we don't know if the function is eventually going to settle down and become horizontal, right? But the graphs are trying, the, the arrows are trying to indicate that that's not gonna happen. The graph is just keep, just gonna keep growing in their direction. So you see that the limit as X goes to minus infinity, is plus infinity. 
the graph is increasing as x goes to minus infinity. And on the other extreme, as x goes to plus infinity, the graph is decreasing. So we write this. The limit is minus infinity when x goes to plus infinity. Now here are some remarks before the examples of those. These should also be straightforward to think about. If the limit of f of x is plus or minus infinity, there is not going to be a horizontal asymptote, at least associated to this particular limit, the limit at infinity. And similarly for x going to minus infinity. So all, all I'm saying is that if you have a graph that's increasing forever, well, then it's not approaching any horizontal line as x goes to plus infinity. But there could be an, a slanted asymptote or not. Like just, again, just looking at this graph here, it doesn't look like there will be one. It looks like the graph is becoming more and more vertical. But you might also have examples of graphs that increase forever, but in such a way that they tend to become parallel to a certain line. Both of these could happen with an infinite limit at infinity. So this was one remark. The other remark is, by the way, there exist functions such that the limit at infinity or minus infinity does not exist. And what we mean by that is it's not a number and it's also not plus or minus infinity. It simply does not exist. The reason why that happens is oscillations. Think for example of the sine function. Both at plus and minus infinity, you see that the graph is not approaching just one number because it keeps oscillating. And it's also not approaching plus or minus infinity. It stays between minus one and one forever. So there simply is no limit at infinity or minus infinity in this case. So keep this in mind. You don't need to have a specific value. And this remark is here more because of the book. I, I'm just gonna mention this particular language that the book likes to use. I'm not gonna use this, but you will see problems in the book where they say determine the end behavior. So if a problem says that for a function whose domain is everything, then what, what they mean is simply determine the limits as x goes to minus infinity and plus infinity. That's what they mean by end behavior. Uh, but in the second item here, I'm mentioning that if, you, if your function has a domain that stops somewhere like this, minus infinity to six, and they are saying determine the end behavior, what they mean is find the two limits as x approaches the extremes of that interval. So one of them is a limit at minus infinity, but the other one is a lateral limit at the number six. All right, so just think of this function. The domain stops right here at the number six. So whatever this function could be doing, who knows why? what is the reason why it stopped there? Maybe because it, it has a vertical asymptote there, and it's not defined after six. So anyway, if they gave you this graph and said, determine the end behavior, your answer here would be this, the limit as x goes to minus infinity is whatever this number L is. And also the limit as x goes to six from the left side what is it in this graph? It's infinity. Just so you know how to answer book problems. But now let me actually give you examples of infinite limits at infinity. These are very simple here. We have the x squared and the x cubed functions. So I'm going to draw the graphs. And based on the graphs alone, we should be able to answer these. As you know, x squared is this parabola function. x cubed also looks like that, at least on one of the sides. But the on the negative side, it has that arm just uh, flipped around the x-axis. 
this is x cubed and this is x squared. Why is this happening? The square of a negative number is positive, but the cube of a negative number is negative. This is what the graphs look like. So just looking at them, we see, for example, for the x squared function, as x approaches either plus or minus infinity, the function is growing without bounds and to the positive side. So both of these limits are infinity for x squared. Meanwhile, for x cubed, so if you are on the right side here, as x goes to plus infinity, it's the same. It's growing without bounds on the positive side. So this first limit here is plus infinity. But the second one is negative infinity. The function becomes arbitrarily large, but negative right here. So why is this example being mentioned here? Um, this is going to be a, a rule of thumb for us about polynomials. How do we deal with polynomials? Now here's a, a more complex polynomial with, with more coefficients in it. What is gonna happen here now? So what is a good way to think about this polynomial? The answer is always look at the highest denom highest degree term. So let me actually write this in words. Solution as absolute value of x becomes large. What happens with this expression is that the term of highest degree becomes the dominating one. That should be easy to believe. I, I, I feel like if x is large in absolute value, x to the fifth compared to the other degrees of x in here is much larger in size. So that's the term that's gonna determine the limits at infinity. That's, I mean, the, the, the reason why we are studying large absolute value of x is because we're interested in limits at infinity. And so what happens with the this, dominating term here, the minus two x to the five. What are its limits? What we have to understand here is, first of all, the degree is odd. It's raised, raised to a fifth. So you know that the answers will be different. Well, x to the fifth for a negative number is also negative. That's what I mean. However, you also need to remember there is a negative number in front of it, this coefficient minus two, that's going to affect the sign of infinity. So for example, the first one here, x to the five, if x is very large, but positive, x to the five is also very large, but positive. This would be a plus infinity, just with the x to the five. However, there is a negative number in front of that, minus two. So you need a minus sign there. I'm just going to color code this. This minus sign is coming from that number. Doesn't matter that it was a two or a three, whatever that number is, because two times infinity is infinity. And similarly, this one becomes a plus. X to the five alone would be negative, but with another negative in front becomes a plus. And the answer for the P itself are going to be, the answers are going to be the same. This term is the one that dominates. All right, so I encourage you to graph this function using a computer just to see that this is actually happening to it. When x is small, it's going to oscillate, like the, the other terms are gonna cause some oscillations, but for x large, it's the first term that determines what happens. So that's the rule of thumb that I'm mentioning here. Limits at infinity for a polynomial, they are determined by the term of highest degree. And they are gonna depend both on the coefficient in front of the term, more precisely on the sign of that coefficient, and also on the fact that whether n is even or odd. So that you understand what happens at plus and minus infinity. So what I have here now are three functions 
for each one, for each one, we're trying to find the horizontal asymptotes, which means we're trying to find limits both as x goes to plus and minus infinity. And what's going to happen with in each, they are what's called rational functions, ratios of polynomials. So what you should not do, for example, in, in item A, if you're trying to find this limit as x goes to infinity of f of x, you cannot say it's equal to infinity plus 1 over infinity plus infinity plus minus 5, which is simply plugging in infinity. Because what, what does that give you? It's infinity over infinity, right? Something like infinity plus infinity, that's infinity as well. However, what is infinity over infinity? That's indeterminate. You cannot do that. It could be a number, it could be infinity, it could be zero. It depends on the relative sizes between these infinities. And in fact, if you look again at F, the expression that you expect to be larger here is the bottom one, the denominator, because of the x to the fourth, which is larger than the x squared. So you actually expect this fraction to be going to zero because the denominator is larger than the numerator as x grows large. But how do we prove this? How do we actually show this using algebra? The answer is that you, what you want to do in, in cases like this is divide both numerator and denominator by the highest degree term in the denominator, which is x to the fourth in this case. You don't change the function when you do that, right? If you divide by x to the fourth, uh, this is what you get. So for example, x cubed divided by x fourth is one over x. That's what I'm doing here. You're gonna get exactly this. Um, and now this is, I, I forgot the limit sign here, sorry. Limit x goes to infinity should have been in here. What is this limit now? Now it's something for which you can, it is true that you can plug in infinity in a sense. In other words, every term of the form number over power of x, all of these guys are gonna go to zero because x is going to infinity. So for example, one over x squared is going to one over infinity, that's zero. But after you've determined that, the number that you have left is not a zero over zero or infinity over infinity. This is zero over one. That's perfectly well-defined and that's the number zero. So this is the procedure here. And by the way, the limit as x goes to minus infinity is also the same thing. You do exactly the same, copy this down because the same procedure will work for minus infinity as well. But once again, just remember, uh, if you have a non-zero number, for example, like this one here, divided by a number that's going to minus infinity or plus infinity, it doesn't matter, it's still going to zero. It doesn't really matter which side of zero it's coming from, zero is zero. So this is still gonna be a zero over one which is zero. Those are the two limits for F. The problem was actually asking for horizontal asymptotes, which means we need to give the equation of the lines. We found numbers for the answers here, zero and zero. So it's just one asymptote and it's Y equals zero. It's the only horizontal asymptote. So this is what we need to be doing for all of these problems here. Let me go over B now. What's gonna happen in B is interesting. It's again, if you try to compute limit as x goes to infinity, it's again gonna be an infinity over infinity. But this time they, they are of comparable sizes. The degrees are the same, it's x squared for both. So what you expect to happen is that the function should be going to a number, a non-zero number. But how do we do that? How do we see that? We simplify the numerator and denominator, divide by highest degree of denominator, which is x squared. So I'm gonna write that in here so I can copy it down there. Uh, I'm dividing the numerator and denominator of g by x squared. Uh, 
the expression would be equal to this. So let me just copy this down and erase it from here. I don't want to have that in here, but I want it in here. G of X is equal to this expression for any X that's not zero, but that's okay because we are interested in limits at infinity. So what is the limit? In fact, it doesn't matter which one, either plus or minus infinity. This is always gonna be the case, by the way, with rational functions like these at least in items a and b. Um, the expressions of the form a over x, they're all going to zero, no matter if you're going to plus or minus infinity. So you have a three plus zero plus zero divided by a minus two plus zero. That's just three over minus two, or usually you wanna move the negatives from the denominator into the front of the fraction. That's the limit either one, so there is still only one horizontal asymptote, this one, y equals minus three halves. That's the answer for g. And the last one, the function h, similar procedure. This time though, the highest degree is in the numerator the numerator tends to become much larger than the denominator. And what this means is that we expect to find a limit equal to either plus or minus infinity. Which one? That's gonna depend. Depends on the sign of this expression. But let's see what happens as we divide both numerator and denominator by highest degree of denominator, which is one. So I'm gonna simplify age, again, writing it up here so I can see the function. Uh, okay, and then one minus five over x, but this minus is in front of the x squared. Uh, yes, this is correct. That's your function, age. There you go. Now it is in a form that allows us to at least say something about the limits at infinity and minus infinity. Limit of h of x. Let's do them separately just to be sure we understand. What's gonna happen with the limit? This time in the numerator, you see an infinity, actually a minus infinity. Plus one minus zero over one minus zero. Okay, so you see the x square is the term that's giving us, or rather a minus x square is giving us a minus infinity. And what's happening now with the numbers, infinity plus one, for example, is just infinity. When you, when you take infinity and add numbers to it, that doesn't change the infinity, right? In other words, a really large number and negative plus one, it's still a very large negative number. So really, that minus infinity is, is the numerator here and one in the denominator. What is this? This is minus infinity. Now, I just wanted you to be careful about what could happen here as you go to minus infinity. In this case, this is not really gonna matter. You see that what changes as you plug in minus infinity for x, you might get, you might actually end up with a different sign here. But look, it's raised to a square. That's really not gonna matter here. The minus infinity square will produce a plus infinity, which together with the another minus outside still makes a minus. Uh, this, this was a simple, sorry, this, these guys were zeros. Just like above. So still minus infinity. But anyway, technically you, don't, you didn't need to know exactly the values of the limits for this question. We just wanted to know if H has a horizontal asymptote or not. 
uh, it's not going to have one if, if you found infinite limits. Only if you found numbers, those would give you horizontal asymptotes. So H does not have no horizontal asymptote. This is my last slide here. Remark, it's useful to remember the following limits. These, these guys here are talking about exponentials and logarithms. Uh, so if, if you're trying to understand limits at infinity for exponentials, which mean b raised to x, where b is some fixed number, it matters whether b is, uh, is larger than one or smaller than one. Usually b has to be larger than zero for the exponential to be defined. So those those two cases actually have different behaviors. Here's what happens. This is b to the x, where b is larger than one. For example, e to the x looks like this. However, this is b to the x for a b that's less than one. Well, when a number is less than one, if you raise it to larger and larger positive powers, it actually decreases down to zero. So just looking at these graphs, it, I think it's just useful to remember the graphs instead of remembering these limits, trying to memorize these guys, because looking at the graphs uh, gives you the answers here. As x goes to infinity, you find an infinity here, but a zero here, for example those correspond to this and this, right? And so on. Now the last one here for the logarithm, you see that the two limits that I'm giving are at infinity and at zero from the right. Why? Because the domain of logarithm stops there. Here is the log function, ln x. In fact, this is also log with any base larger than one. So you can see as x goes to infinity, the limit is infinity. As x goes to zero from the right, the limit is minus infinity. This is the end behavior of the log function. Again, just try to remember, remember the graph so you understand these. Now, knowing these limits will be useful to solve limit problems where these functions appear, but you will see this in the recitation. <laughs>